So you have this collapsing cloud that's going faster and faster and spinning faster and faster as it collapses. What happens when something spins faster and faster? Stuff gets thrown out again, right? So somehow a star has to lose angular momentum to form. Some of it may have to do with chemistry, with, with, with actually different compounds forming, magnetic field, dynamics, gases. There's a lot left to learn about exactly how it happens. You never put a pin down and say, we understand this perfectly. The planets may have actually moved around. There could have been planets that uh, got thrown out of the solar system or into the sun. There's always a next, well, wait a minute, why does that happen? And, and that's what makes being a scientist so cool. I think that a lot of people think about NASA as being an institution that thinks that everything is figured out. All of the science is done, everything is put together in their neat little boxes labeled, and there's just finishing touches. And she has a vision where she recognizes that that isn't the case. And she knows that there's lots of puzzles, and she knows that there's things that don't make sense and people are trying to figure it out. And so in our conversation, we really tried to understand how NASA and the greater astronomy community, quote unquote, knows what they know. And it was really illuminating to hear Dr. Thaler talking about the things they don't know and the uncertainty that actually remains for all of you to go out and research. And we got a big load of information about stars, which I'll be the first to admit I have a very cursory understanding of the details. Like I, I have I have roughly a picture of it, but I'm not an expert. And so it's nice to have somebody come through and be like, hey, this is the steel man of the story that we have right now. And then be able to kind of pick at, well, what parts of it can change and what parts of it should change and what parts of it are changing. And we're opening up a wider investigation into stars. So look forward to brown dwarf discussion, neutron stars. We're doing it all. It's coming on. We have Basri from Berkeley coming on the show, and we're going to be talking to him about the delineation of star versus planet, which is also a field that has a lot of room for discussion because it's almost a philosophical, ontological categorization of things as opposed to an actually clearly delineated boundary. But it might play a huge role in the science because if planets are... You know, stars, where, like if it's a totally arbitrary designation, then they might play a huge role in the formation of a solar system, too. Or they would play a massively different role in the formation than the one that we think that yeah, they yeah, play exactly. right now. Okay, very cool. Cool. So enjoy the conversation, guys. And don't forget to support us on Patreon. Please. At Demystify Sci. We need you. We do need you. We need you. You. And you. <laughs> and you, you too. The scientific revolution starts now. I really want to get a general picture from you about the lives and deaths of stars and try to understand what questions remain open because at least when I was coming up through science and you know, long before I did my PhD, I was trying to assess the landscape, like what questions remain to be solved. And I got like this unsettled, I, I, I don't know, I got a really bad feeling that everything was already taken care of for quite a while. And I know that's not the case now. So I was hoping that you could help us understand how stars form, what we don't understand, and what we're doing right now to find out. You know, at, okay, so at its most basic, right, stars are, are actually quite simple things. So you, you have, uh, you know, hydrogen was created during the Big Bang, lots of it, and some helium. And that was pretty much it, you know. And, uh, and so, um, you know, over time, and, you know, we don't exactly understand, you know, the very specifics, like I said, of how this began. You know, maybe there was uh, you know, some, some concentrations of dark matter. But, you know, there, there were areas in the universe that became denser than others. And you know that mean, that means gravity had a chance. Gravity had a chance. Once you get more more stuff in one part of the universe than the other, uh, then uh, you know gravity has a chance to start bringing more stuff together. Gravity just brings stuff together. That's the force that that does that. And um, you know gravity also has this wonderful you know that you, you just sort of go through the physics. You 
you, you get this big cloud of hydrogen gas and it starts collapsing because there's so much gravity. When you say when you say gas, I always have a hard time thinking about this because when I think of a gas on Earth, I think of molecules that if you if you had them in in an area, they would just kind of disperse. And so when we speak of gas in space, is it some other substance than what I'm thinking about in a box on Earth? Or is it... Is it cold? Yeah, is it cold? Is it behaving in some strange way that like induces it to, to collapse that way? Well, let me ask you a question. So I think you would agree that our atmosphere is made of gas, right? You know, I'm, I'm breathing right now. I'm breathing oxygen and nitrogen and all that. Um, how does the gas stay here on Earth? Why doesn't it just drift off into space? Well, uh, as far as I understand, it's a combination of gravity and electromagnetism right because you have at least in a huge or electrostatics, part maybe? yeah electrostatics like if you wouldn't have a magnetic field then there would be no atmosphere okay so that's actually okay so let's let's go back to the beginning then um just take the earth you know by itself um if you had uh the earth and the gases around it the the, the atmosphere is really held down by gravity gases are made out of molecules and atoms and yes they're 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 not as as compact as they are in solids to liquids and they're kind of bouncing around but they have mass and they feel gravity just as much as anything else and the gases you know in the uh you know the the hydrogen between the galaxies is god i don't even have numbers trillions and trillions and trillions of times less dense than the air in this room you know i mean i mean seriously many 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 trillions of times less but they're still molecules and they still feel gravity so, you know, Jupiter and Saturn are planets that are made mostly of, we say, gas. Gas is just a way of saying that the molecules are, are free. They're, they haven't made bonds, you know, in, in a solid. They, they may be you know, bonding together in a, in, a, in a structure, a crystal structure, or in a liquid. They may be feeling different forces. So, Is there, is there anything like that that happens in this, uh, con- what do you call it, uh, accretion process? Is there like any kind of chemistry going on that you imagine? Is there like condensation or, you know, yeah. gases do bizarre things when you, when you call, cool them. and Right, precipitation even, right? Yeah. So now, now you're getting into those specifics. You know, yes, <laughs> Sorry. chemistry does affect the way stars form. But, but so let me just go back. So, so the atmosphere of the Earth is held down simply by gravity. And now, electromagnetism the, has no, no, ro- so like if you were to take away the magnetic field of the Earth and imagine that you could still somehow shield that it, like, the solar it, wind. It, it keeps it in place once it's there, but gravity is the thing that accomplished it in the first place, if I understand. So, okay, if the Earth were just by itself and nothing was influencing it, gravity would hold down the atmosphere without a magnetic field. No problem. Could sit there forever. The magnetic field doesn't really keep the gases down. What the magnetic field does is it protects us from the sun's wind of particles from blowing our atmosphere away. So, you know, we live here on Earth and gravity is holding down the gas. And and that was, I mean, mean, most spectacularly, that used to be true of Mars. Mars used to have an atmosphere that was thick like ours. There was rain, there was water, there was, you know, an entire weather cycle, cycle on Mars. The problem is Mars didn't have a magnetic field. So both planets began with atmospheres and gravity holding down the gases. But Mars wasn't protected, as you say, from the the sun's wind of particles. And so without the influence of the sun, our atmosphere is fine. It'll it'll stick around pretty much as long as we want. But the sun has this wind of particles that we live in that blows away atmospheres. And that's why our magnetic field protects us. But it doesn't keep the gases down. The the, the gases can, can just float right through the magnetic field. The the gases themselves are not electrically charged, so they don't even feel a magnetic field. Is it possible to see... So if I'm imagining what's happening, what happened on Mars correctly, there should be kind of an eddy behind the planet on the on the lee side from the sun. Would you expect to find like some denser atmosphere there? And in fact, um, you know, Mars acts in some ways like a giant comet. Um, You know, there are gases being blown off Mars even today, and Mars loses many, many tons of gas a day. And um, but but there's other things, too, like, for example, um, things you could look up. Remember Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. It doesn't really have much of an atmosphere, but the sun's wind is so intense, it actually blows heavier elements off of Mercury. And so there's actually a tail, like a comet behind Mercury of things like sodium calcium, heavy stuff. 
And um, you can take pictures of that if you have a telescope that is looking for that, those particular energies of light emitted by those elements. Mars has absolutely got a tail coming off its atmosphere. And in fact, we have a mission called MAVEN, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Explorer. And um, MAVEN is orbiting Mars and dipping into the atmosphere to, to figure out how much atmosphere is being blown away and how much has been blown away over billions of years. And so, uh, but, uh, you know, Pluto, think about this, Pluto all the way as far away as it is from the sun, you know, billions of miles away from the sun, uh, uh, the, the solar wind is actually blasting hundreds of tons of atmosphere off of Pluto every day. And Pluto as well has a cometary tail that New Horizons flew through when it went by Pluto. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, it's, it's the sun that, that blasts away atmospheres. Gas responds to gravity just fine. I mean, we're talking a lot of gravity. I mean, gas doesn't really cling to me, you know, because I'm not very uh, dense, not very, not very heavy. <laughs> but um, can I ask a stupid question about that? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. um, we're always taught, you know, in basic physics that objects can't do work on themselves. Is gravity an exception to that rule? Are these, is this collapse process? Because it seems like it'd take a ton of work to clamp down these molecules to the point that they're fusing. Is that an exception to the thermodynamic law that objects can't do work on themselves? Well, gravity is a force, right? I mean, it's an exchange of particles that exerts a force. So, you know, in 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 that case, I mean, it's it's not it's it's actually the force itself that's doing the work that's moving things together. So it's 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 not somebody, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's 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 actually the curvature of space and time. So. You know, the, 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 this is what Einstein said gravity really is. You know, gravity at its most basic is actually a structure, curvature of space and time. Particles have to follow that because they, we move through space and time. And so what an orbit really is, is space gets bent and warped around an object with mass. And as something would e could even try just to fly in a straight line, like, you know, just you know, put something in motion out in space and let it go. It has to travel through that warped space. And so that's really what an orbit is. So it's not actually something doing work. It's, 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 it's an actual structural part of our universe. Is there any significance to it occurring in twos, like this binary thing? Is, is that significant that you said most stars occur in twos? Is that significant in this process? And like, what happened to our partner? Oh, but I, you, so you guys are asking so many good questions. And, and, and so I'm just all, curious. Yeah, I'm just yeah. really... These are the things we talk about in our kitchen. About the stars. <laughs> no, there might not be answers to a lot of these questions. I'm just, I'm just looking... I'm you know, just interested, yeah. So we are unusual. Yeah, I mean, mo most, uh, most, plant, most star systems uh, have either a binary star, two, or more. It doesn't have to be just two. We know of some that our systems have up to... I think we know one that's about, that's at least five. I mean, what ones there are four? Ones there are four stars are even fairly common. Um, the uh, the nearest the nearest system to us, Alpha Centauri, uh, there is a uh, uh, you know a, 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 there's there's a you know, there there are these two very bright stars going around each other, and then there's a dimmer one on sort of a, a longer orbit, Alpha Centauri Proxima, and that's actually the nearest star to us right now. So stars form in groups. So we're, we're going back to how do stars form. Um, when we when we watch star formation today, and, and we have gorgeous images from the Hubble Space Telescope, and hopefully the web will give us even better ones, you know, we, we see that what happens with these giant clouds of gas in the universe is, I mean, these days when there are other stars around, usually what happens is a star lives its lifetime and dies and explodes. And that explosion sends a shockwave through all the gas around it. And, and that creates sort of turbulence. Things start to swirl around. And then bits of the bits of the uh, the cloud get more dense, and as they do, they draw in more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. And so, usually, when stars form, they, they form in groups of of dozens or hundreds. And and so, we see these clusters of of, of newborn stars all together. And I mean, just because most of them formed quite close to each other, you know, I mean, the, the, these these bits of gas that started to swirl together to form a star. There was just so much nearby that, you know, yes, for the most part, stars have a binary companion or more, you know, different ones. So the sun is kind of unusual. I mean, we, we believe we probably formed in such a cluster billions of years ago. But the problem is, is that that was so long ago that the, the sun has traveled around the galaxy many times since it was formed. 
there's been different gravitational interactions, you know, stars, you know, kind of change each other's paths. So there, there's nowhere that we can point to and say, you know, we think that's our home cluster of stars or our nebula. And unfortunately, no. I mean, there's there's some people that well, that wonder if, if maybe we're part of different clusters in the sky, but there's no real consensus on it. But, uh, you know, I would say, you know, if you looked at the sky, say, you know, four and a half billion years ago, it was probably, you know, much more full of nearby stars of our cluster that has since drifted away. And um, does that, su- so does that suggest that the solar system was significantly different at some point in the past? Because oftentimes we talk about the solar system as having been formed and remained as as it is now. And if you have a situation where you have multiple suns, I would imagine that that would significantly shift the distribution of planetary objects within the orbit. I would expect something very, very complicated, and we have something that's not quite so right now. So does that mean that it shifted significantly, or did it shift and then form, or what's the process? Oh, I, I would say the planets were forming, or at least beginning to form, when we were still close to other stars. I think that's very likely. And, and like I said, you know, the, the problem is we don't have any evidence of exactly what happened. But but this is where we go to our current observations. You know, we look we look at our images from Hubble and, and the other telescopes, ground-based telescopes that are looking at where stars are forming. And yes, indeed, the stars influence the formation of planets and the way the planets are working around nearby stars. In fact, um, there's a famous Hubble Space Telescope image. Well, it's actually several images of the Orion Nebula. And uh, there are stars that have formed close to another star. And the, 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 the winds of particles from this nearby star are actually destroying the planets that are trying to form around these other, other stars. Um, we have evidence that the solar system was once very different than it is now. And um, the, uh, the planets you know, um, may have actually moved around. There could have been planets that uh, got thrown out of the solar system or into the sun. And um, you know, even the Earth, we think, was hit by uh, at least one other planet probably about the same size as we were uh, about 4 billion years ago. And we have, we have other evidence that is kind of mind blowing that the planet Jupiter, um, as it was forming gravitationally moved around, probably in as about as far as Mars is. And as it got drawn back out into the solar system, it, ca- it caused all kind of havoc and brought you know, all sorts of comets in to hit us and everything. So solar systems are dynamic. Um, right now, our solar system has been very calm and steady for billions of years, no, no big planetary collisions that we know of. Um, but especially when they're forming, there are lots of planets trying to form and some of them get too close to each other. Some of them get too big and they start to, they start to change each other's orbits. And it, indeed, we think that's what happened with Jupiter. Um, Jupiter actually started forming while there was still a disk of gas and dust swirling around the sun. So this was early, this was fairly early in the lifetime of the sun. And, uh, and as it interacted with that disk, it actually swirled in and then moved back out again. And uh, this is called the grand tack hypothesis. Uh, tacking comes from the sailing term to tack against the wind. And uh, because Jupiter was moving around, you know, sort of in different parts of the solar system. The, um, going back sort of to the moon, we would never have known this if we hadn't brought back Apollo moon rocks. Um, we brought back moon rocks to, to our laboratories. The astronauts uh, brought them back. And scientists analyzed them and said, what, what the hell is this? Um, the, the, the rocks, you know, if the moon had, fall, had formed independently, like both the earth and the moon were sort of areas that were collapsing in the cloud, they started to orbit each other, then you would expect the rocks to be maybe a little more different from each other. Um, these rocks were very similar to the earth, but anything that could burn, anything that was volatile, anything that would have been dispersed during an explosion was gone. And the, the moon, we are pretty certain, is actually the debris from when a planet hit the earth. And that threw up a cloud, probably a ring around the earth for a while. And then that ring, the gravity brought stuff together into what we, what is now the moon. So, you know, just look up at the moon and you'll see that the solar system is dynamic and violent. And, uh, and, and that, that also has to do with how we got here. Because we believe, when I say we, I mean us being organic water-based creatures. Um, when we look at other solar systems forming, planets that form close to their stars like the Earth is, all of the lighter stuff like water vapor, methane and stuff gets blown away by, the, that, by that wind of particles coming out of the sun. And it doesn't really condense and it starts to settle down into ices that you can build planets out of until you get to the, where Jupiter and Saturn are. 
And so the earth probably, at least when it began, did not have much water on it at all. And it may have had none on the surface. There might have been water dissolved in the minerals of the other uh, rocks. But then when Jupiter started moving around, it started throwing in all of this stuff from the outer solar system, icy asteroids, comets, small moons, small planets, who knows? And um, with it came the chemistry of life. Uh, just, uh, just two weeks ago, NASA released the result that we have now found all of the building blocks of DNA and RNA, uh, our, our genetic code and that which is, yeah, in, in meteorites. Do you think it's possible that that all the like if we did have a partner star in the in the first place that that could be cause for all of this motion to happen because it seems like if there wasn't what what would cause all these planets to move around like we see these uh like what do they call them uh hot neptunes or there's there is presumably motion of planets what are the instigating factors that could cause a stable system to just you know start wandering all over the place planets start smacking into each other and you know. So there, there, there's two things. Um, one is that when the planets are forming, um, you know, a star is a collapsing cloud of hydrogen gas. And, and eventually the core of that collapse gets so hot that it ignites a nuclear reaction. And, and, and the, just the heat from that actually sustains the star. The gravity is trying to make it collapse, but there's the nuclear reaction inside, so it, it, it can't collapse it. But that whole, that whole cloud as it collapsed began to spin. And, and you, may, you may realize that the universe is very good at making disks. You see disks everywhere. Our galaxy is a disk. The solar system is a disk. You know, uh, the, 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 you know, the rings of Saturn are a beautiful disk. When you, when you get a, a cloud to collapse, it starts to spin. And, and then that pretty much gives a direction to everything in the cloud. And over time, the disk gets, gets thinner. And, and so you have this nice disk. And this is and just so, like a figure skater or something, right? This is yeah, like a conservation just, just, of right. angular that's, momentum type thing. That's the classic example. It's just conservation of angular momentum. Gravity is bringing in this cloud. And just because there would have been a little bit of, you know, just mo any little bit of drifting motion of the cloud would be actually accelerated, you know, you know, given, given you know, it gets faster and faster as gravity brings it together, just like the ice skater bringing her arms in and spinning faster and faster. So you have this, this disk of material around young solar systems, and we see this. This was the way that we found young solar systems before we could find individual planets. We saw that there were these disks of spinning material. And the Hubble Space Telescope, again, has taken wonderful images in the Orion Nebula of these disks spinning around young stars. And so when planets were forming, there was a lot of stuff between the planets. There was all of this debris and gas and dust and little rocks and ices and everything. And so what, what, what got, we think, the planets to start smacking each other is, is interacting with this disk. This disk, this disk produced drag. Mm, so I mean, like a, ton, a ton of tiny little collisions, basically. That's right. So I mean, as Jupiter and the gravity as well, not just the collisions, but the gravitational interaction of Jupiter with the you know, the, the, the stuff in the disk. And so the idea is that, that Jupiter starts forming, you know, pretty far away. We don't know exactly where, but somewhere out where things are condensing and cool. But then it's it, it's plowing through this disk, and that actually you know that actually disperses some of the. Uh, the angular momentum, and it begins to spiral in. And, and so then what we think happened to bring it back out again, how, how did it ever get back out again? Uh, other big planets start forming outside, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And, and as these planets start forming in the solar system, they gravitationally tug Jupiter back out. And, um, and we don't think that was gentle. Uh, you, you know that the planet Uranus is on its side, and the whole thing's, the moons look like they've been smacked apart. Um, that may have happened because of these gravitational interactions. So, um, you know, our, our, our solar system, and, 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 and like you said, we, we see this happening in other solar systems. Mm, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, how do you, how do you know that those, uh, obviously these things take millions of years, like the formation of these disks and all of this, right? Like, I assume you don't just like push record on the, on the video camera and watch a, a, an accretion disk form and, and turn into planets. Like you, you're seeing snapshots, right? How do you know that those are young stars? Well, um, the Orion Nebula, I think, is a wonderful example of this. I mean, so you're, you're absolutely right. Humans don't live very long. And so, you know, we, we're not going to see, you know, a lot of changes in disks. Interestingly enough, we do see evidence of planets colliding because that goes very fast. That's smash. And so we actually see evidence of that happening in other solar systems. Um, but as far as watching a disk evolve, so what you look for 
uh, in, in the first step you see, l- let me make this analogy. I mean, we, we exist for so little time. So how do we know that this process is what's going on? So what, what I sort of compare it to is, is say that you're you know, an alien that wants to understand human life. And all you're going to do is just fly by the earth. You're not even going to stop. You're just going to take lots and lots of pictures of people as you go. And so you, you go back to your home world and you're looking at all these pictures you've taken. And you see that there are some patterns. Um, some humans seem to be smaller. Um, some humans are larger. Um, the, uh, there seems to be something to do with uh, some humans get these bulges in their abdomens and then, and then they go to places where small humans appear. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and then, and then you see that there, there, there seem to be all, you know, there seem to be humans where their bodies aren't working very well anymore. Um, I mean, that may happen anytime throughout a life of a human, but it seems to happen, you know, at, 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 you know, there seems to be a cluster of people that, that then, you know, then you see humans that are, are dead. You, you, so if you could just see the, you know, the entirety of human life and, and some things you, you might think is a pattern, but you could be wrong. I mean, you know, for example, we've been wrong about how this worked many times. You might say, well, I see humans of different skin tone. Uh, does that have anything to do with evolution? Do people with lighter skin tone evolve into people with darker skin tone? And, and I mean, we've done stuff like that with stars where we, we, we would thought we've seen patterns that didn't turn out to be true. But what, can you think of any of those off the top of your head? I just think this stuff is really inspiring for yeah, kids yeah. who think it's all nailed down. You know, it's more just like these are the best stories that we can tell given all the evidence that we have. And then, you know, sometimes the paradigms shift radically, too. Yeah. I so so actually I I, I use skin color for a reason. Um, there there actually was a time when we thought the colors of stars because stars do come in different colors. They they can be blue or orange or yellow or red. And um, there was a time we actually thought that was a sequence that they that a single star would turn into those different colors during its normal lifetime. And we actually called that the main sequence of stellar evolution. This was all the way back in you know about a hundred years ago. And we, we now know that the color of a star will not change much during that star's lifetime. It, it, it will definitely change as the star dies. But during, during its lifetime, basically the color you start with is still the, the color you end with. And, uh, and, and that, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect example. There was a time we thought the colors of stars change from one to the other. Just like an alien might say, do people of different skin tones change from one to the other? But that turned out not to be true. So, um, in, in the Orion Nebula, just the Orion Nebula, we can take pictures of hundreds of stars in the process of formation. And it goes all the way from a pregnant woman. So there are gas clouds that don't have stars inside them yet, but they're swirling together and becoming warmer. And, and almost just like a pregnant human being, um, the, the actual ignition of a star happens inside a cloud where we can't see it very well. We use special telescopes to try to look through the dust to see what's going on. And this is something that the Webb telescope is going to be great at. In infrared light, will actually go through the dust. And you can actually see these hot little cores inside the, 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 the stellar dust cloud that you know are the very beginnings of stars. And we, we call those proto-stars, before stars. Um, then stars have a tantrum. Uh, basically, when stars are very young, their nuclear reactions are not stable. And inside, from the cloud, I have pictures of all of this. I wish I could show you pictures. You'll see, uh, a, a, you'll see a cloud of dust and gas. And then you'll see these jets shooting out of it from, mm. from, from, from some sort of I've dark these, region inside. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's because the star has just turned on. Mm. And, and that, those are called uh, T-Tari or, or herbic harrow objects. And they're basically jets from the unstable young star. Then all of the radiation and jets and particles begin to disperse the cloud. And then you begin to see these very, very young stars. And you can tell that by looking at their temperatures and their masses and how they're, you know, how they're burning. And, uh, and then that's the first time you see them. And then they're, again, beautiful pictures, like, like even the one, the picture behind you of young clusters of stars just beginning to blow away and move out of their cocoon. And so, you know, then we see dying stars, right? I mean, we see stars like the big bloated red giants that go unstable before they die and get huge. And, and then basically unravel into space. Um, or we see stars explode violently. So, you know, some stars have sort of gentle deaths, some have, uh, you know, more spectacular deaths. But, but the idea is that over the last decades, most well, centuries, I guess, really, you know, astronomers have built up images of millions, millions of stars. And, and, we, and we've looked for the patterns to see 
you know, okay, here's a, here's a star that's still in its womb, still in its core. We can just see it's getting hot in there. You know, here it's just beginning to break out. Here you can see all these young baby stars together. So even though we can't see that change, we can take enough pictures that we can start to piece the story together. And like I said, there have been things that we got wrong. But uh, I would say for the last, at least the last, say, 70 years or so, it's been pretty consistent. I mean, the, 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 the one where we, when, we, when we realize that color is not something, a star doesn't go from a red star to a blue star. Um, that was perhaps the last big mistake that we, we made. We, we didn't know. I mean, it, it was just, you know, we, we didn't understand it yet. And now we do. What caused that shift? So um, it happens that the color of a star is actually really just related to how massive it is. And stars come in a whole range of masses. Um, the, 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 the least massive stars might only be about 100 times the mass of Jupiter. And uh, by the way, they're only about the size of Jupiter. They're just much more compressed. Hmm. Get are all these that brown dwarfs? Um, well, no, these are actually called M dwarfs stars. Dwarfs aren't ignited yet, so they're not technically uh, stars. Okay, so yeah, what well, are they called? Uh, so, so, I mean, brown, brown dwarfs are sort of, you know, you know, Jupiter up to the very, you know, in the very lightest stars, the least massive stars. And, and, and brown dwarfs do glow very faintly, but not in visible light. I mean, they, they glow in infrared light and heat light. Uh, but then you get to the range where you can actually start nuclear re nuclear fusion in the middle. And uh, like I said, the, the most um, common type of star in the universe are these low mass stars. They're called M stars. And there are, there are millions and millions more M stars, millions of times more M stars than anything else, basically. And are uh, all M stars the same color? Yeah, they're all, they're all kind of this dim red. And, uh, and they have solar systems. We're finding lots of solar systems around these M stars, too. We're trying to figure out how you work when the star is that different. So then you go to the yellow stars, yellow, white, uh, orange stars. And, and, and those stars you know, are things that are around, around the mass of the sun. Uh, and they, uh, they, they, you know, they glow in those colors. Again, just depending on how massive you are. It's, it's, almost, it, it's, it's as simple as the colors of turning on a, a, a coil in your oven. So if you turn on a heating coil in your oven, it first glows red. And then it, it, as you increase the energy, it glows kind of orange and then yellow. And if you could increase it even more, it would glow white. And then, I mean, in a foundry where, where it's many thousands of degrees, maybe you could see it glow blue. And that's the hottest color. And so red to blue is actually just a measurement of how hot the star is burning. That has to do with the gravity, how much mass it has to actually turn up the heat inside. And so it's a measurement of the mass of the star. And so a, a little red star stays a little red star, doesn't become a blue star. You know, so that, that was something that we, we realized over the last, uh, you know, last century. And a blue star can't lose enough mass to become a white star and then a mm. yellow and then an orange. Yeah, Did you ever see red. the blue ones in the nurseries? Oh, so yes, yes. And in fact, those are the ones we see the easiest because they're the brightest. Um, you know, those are the stars with the most mass. Uh, they are giving off the peak of their light, either in blue, maybe even in ultraviolet sometimes, light, light we can't even see, but they're producing lots of visible light as well. They are really, really hot. And so uh, the ones that we see the most easily are the blue stars. But like, uh, it, like Anastasia said, do they ever just burp off a huge chunk of mass and then... Or get hit by something or, yeah, and like split ever, in half? Do they ever downshift? Yeah. Uh, well, yes. Uh, you know, interestingly enough... Um, the thing that we observed more, more commonly is actually going the other way when they upshift. When we think that there were two stars that were a binary star, say they were both yellow stars. And the, it, it, over time, they actually started to attract each other more and more until they merged into one star. And then they became a blue star. Um, that's something called a blue straggler. That's something that I, uh, I studied. And uh, that we, we, we think that those are, are stars that may have started out as two stars, but merged into a bigger one. Um, but stars, that, that's, that's observable on human time yeah. frames, or you just well, see the straggler you know, and you, yeah. It's a whole, I, it's a whole, yeah, it's so a it's whole a, saga. Yeah. It's a whole saga. So, so the reason they're called stragglers is that stars are born in clusters. And then the, the, uh, the, the, I mean, stars that have really long lives like the sun move out of clusters, but those, those really hot blue stars, they only live about a million years, then they blow up. And so when you see a cluster of stars, for the most part, you don't see a lot of those big blue stars because they don't live very long. They're all gone. And so what happens is then you see a cluster of stars where all the blue stars are gone, but there's one left that shouldn't be there. You know, it, a star that mass should have already died, but it didn't. Somehow it straggled behind. 
And so that was how they were discovered. And that's what we think these are. So it's not that we observe them merging, but we observe them in a cluster they shouldn't be in, but the cluster should have had all those stars die before. So, so here you're talking about, you know, we, yes, we understand star formation generally, but the, think about, I mean, the way stars influence each other, the way they might merge, the way their winds could, we, we see stars where one wind is blasting material off the other. And yes, that means that star is losing mass. Um, there are some stars that are losing huge amounts of mass. The, the, the problem is, is that stars are really big to begin with. And like I said, stars have a lot of gravity. So you need to find a way to get all that mass off, you know, a significant amount of mass. That's hard. And there, there are some stars that have such strong winds, they are losing a good portion of their, of their mass. And yes, in that case, they will become a cooler and more redder star at the end. Absolutely. And then one last question in this direction. How does this connect to rogue planets? You guys, so, I mean, um, you are asking all the best questions in astronomy. I have to say your, your instinct, your, your instinct as scientists and what you want to know about stars. You know, if, if we had you guys, you know, running astronomy like 50 years ago, you would just bang, 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 you all the questions. <laughs> Save well, so, time. Okay. We stand on um, the shoulders of giants. We have a lot of people in our Facebook yeah. group and our Discord that are just constantly like, how do you explain these things? How do you connect yes, them? Yes, Take an astronomy class because you'll learn about all of this. So, okay, rogue planets. Remember we were talking about Jupiter moving around the solar system and smacking things around? Okay. So what happens when the gravity of something big like Jupiter is moving around the solar system? And maybe you have a near miss of planets, right? And, and one planet gets kind of close to Jupiter, but it wasn't quite close enough to collide, but it gets whipped around and out you go. <laughs> so so absolutely, yes. I wanted to also no. mention too, we're, we're going to have Vasari uh, on the show to talk about brown dwarfs. And <clears throat> it's quite interesting because it seems like they might play an interesting story as it unfolds, as we learn more about how this process happens, because it's like, well, if some stars don't quite turn into stars, if some of these uh, accretion events don't result in enough material to fuse and become a glowing star, um, then what happens to what's left behind? Well, you know, maybe, maybe it looks a lot like a Jupiter or something like that. So it, it's no coincidence that the most stars that there are are these low mass ones. So, I mean, the, the, the big ones are probably a bit harder to form because there's lots of stuff and they blow up really fast. So that leaves, it's easier to form these little stars that then live for a long time. So maybe there's even more brown dwarfs than stars, right? So, I mean, if, if, if these clouds of collapsing hydrogen form these smaller objects more easily, maybe there's even more of the brown dwarfs. Yeah. Uh, so I have a list of questions and we have about 10 more minutes with you. And so I was wondering if we could try to do like a lightning round. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I've never done that before. Okay. So the first thing that I have is the angular momentum paradox, as I've heard it described. Why is it that despite the fact that the sun has the most of the mass of the solar system, most of the angular momentum is in the planets? Okay. So this again is one of the things that w w we are investigating right now. Um, it, yeah. What should happen? So, so I mean, you talk about again. So, so what? What don't we know about star formation? Okay. So you have this collapsing cloud that's going faster and faster and spinning faster and faster as it collapses. What happens when something spins faster and faster? Stuff gets thrown out again, right? So somehow a star has to lose angular momentum to form. Hmm, okay. So one of the ways we think this works, and this is from observing, you know, the sun, and and and, and I mean, again, I mean, stars are easy. And, and, and in general, but specifics get very complicated. We think it probably has something to do with the magnetic field. That as the magnetic field of this young star, you know, everything's collapsing. So even the magnetic field gets stronger. As that magnetic field spins through all this very hot electrically charged gas, that spin actually may create some type of like a friction that actually slows down the star and gets rid of the angular momentum. Um, that's our best idea that it has something to do with the magnetic field of the young star spinning through all this material that creates a drag on the star. But, but you're absolutely right. So, you know, the, 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 the disk was all spinning together. You know, the, uh, the planets have a lot of angular momentum because, I mean, they're spinning quite fast. So they carry a lot of momentum. I mean, the Earth is going at 67,000 miles an hour. That's pretty amazing. So, but the idea about how do you get that core to actually collapse into this hot thing that is a star when when that centripetal force would, would, would throw it, yes. So 
That's one of the big questions in star formation. We think it probably has to do with the magnetic field. Interesting. Okay. I love that. So then the next question is about the moon. Is there significance to the fact that the moon is perfectly sized to block the sun out from the surface <laughs> of the earth? <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out that's just now. Um, so the, the moon is moving farther and farther away all the time. And um, so in the, in the early solar system, the dinosaurs, for example, they would have seen a much larger so there would have been more common lunar and solar eclipses because, in fact, the moon was bigger. So, you know, I mean, I mean, right now, things have to be lined up just perfectly, you know, because, the, you know, as you said, um, the moon is not exactly the same size as the sun. It varies, right? Sometimes you get something called an angular eclipse where you can see an annular eclipse where you can see a ring of the sun around the moon. And sometimes you get longer lunar eclipses because the moon is actually really big. And that just has to do with where the moon is in its orbit whether the moon is a little closer to us or a little farther away from us. So, um, but, but the, uh, so it's not perfect even now, but unfortunately, here's the, here's the sad thing. The moon is moving away. And so someday there will be no total uh, solar eclipses. The moon will be so small. It, it will, we will only have annular eclipses. And the and, oceans uh, will be calm. <laughs> well, you know, I have seen uh, five total eclipses of the sun and they, each one has blown my mind in a different way. They are, it, 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 you, you have to see one in your lifetime. And, you know, of course, it's weather dependent. So you try to get to the ones that are somewhere dry. You really should see one. There's nothing that has made me feel more connected to the universe than that moment. I could really feel like I was on these little balls spinning through space, lining up. And as we say, there's a lunar eclipse this, this weekend in, the, in May. So there's no significance. It's not going to last forever. It's just for us right now, a really nice coincidence. All right. I'm very excited about the lunar eclipse. Next yeah. question. I think that it's called tidal locking, that the moon face, always the same yeah. side of the moon faces the earth. Is that a right. common thing in the solar system? Yes, absolutely. Um, most of the major planets and their moons, their moons are tidally locked. And um, one of the, uh, like if you, if you think about the major moons of Jupiter and Saturn, they are tidally locked. Um, uh, Mercury is nearly tidally locked to the sun. It actually spins just a little bit on its axis, about one and a half times on its axis every time it goes around the sun. And um, one of the things about exoplanets, planets around other solar systems, is that the, um, the easiest planets for us to detect, th this is a detection thing. It's not, you know, it's, it doesn't really reflect reality. But in order to confirm planets, it's, it's easier to see them if they're going around their sun very closely, because they come back again and again and again, and you get a good sense of their orbit. I mean, think about Think about a planet that's out by the orbit of Jupiter, where it takes 12 years to go around once. It's very hard to confirm there's a planet going around. So um, most of the planets we're finding uh, are very close to their stars, like, like well inside the orbit of Mercury. And we think they should all be tidally locked with one side facing the star at all times. We have a supercomputer at NASA that, among other things, is working on the question of what an atmosphere is like when one side is always hot and one side is always cold. Yeah, I can and, imagine that uh, that would, con I mean, my immediate thought is like fire and ice, right? Where if you have yeah. a side that never turns to face it, could you have those icy condensates forming on the backside? And then it when it starts to spin, they, you know, disastrously distribute across the surface. Slushy pool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it all depends on, um, on on the density of the atmosphere. I mean, take, take Venus, right? Um, Venus barely spins on its axis at all. Um, it actually takes Venus longer to spin once on its axis than it does to go around the sun. On, on Venus, the day is longer than the year. So with Venus, you basically have that. You basically have a side always facing the sun. And and yeah, I mean, over the course of a long time, it, it does change a little bit. But but the uh, the temperature on Venus isn't all that different from 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 night to day because you've got this thick atmosphere that, that has winds that distribute the heat. Um, but but if you don't have a Venus-like atmosphere, like if it's more like the Earth's. You know, so we're, we're modeling this. We're using computer models and saying, okay, so you've got this temperature, this density. What happens when you're this close to the star? What happens if you're a little farther away? Temperature isn't quite so extreme. But uh, um, we, um, some of these, uh, these, these Jupiter-like, giant Jupiter-like planets that are very close to their sun, we believe are also tidally locked. And um, the, uh, in some cases, the, we see the atmosphere whipping around at about 6,000 miles an hour, just, just transferring this heat around. So... Yeah, so tidal locking is common throughout the solar system and, and throughout other solar systems. And we're trying to figure out how that influences the, uh, the environment and the climate of a planet. Yeah. Very cool. 
It's been really fascinating to have you on the show today. Uh, I would <laughs> I would love to meet up again. I, I could talk yeah. to you all day long. So, uh, yeah, thanks for giving us the opportunity to ask some wild questions that have been. Oh learning. no, and so I mean, and, it's. I was just saying it's it's kind of fast because you know I, I don't have a whole lot of time to answer these questions. But, but I mean, this is why I got so hooked on astronomy because all of these are good questions that need to be asked and can be answered by doing research. And mm -hmm. yes, we know a little better, for example, about how a protostar loses angular momentum. But some of it may have to do with chemistry, with, with, with actually different compounds forming, magnetic field, dynamics, gases. There's a lot left to learn about exactly how it happens. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I love about science. You never put a pin down and say, we understand this perfectly. I mean, that, that idea is anathema to be. There's always a next, well, wait a minute, why does that happen? And, and that's what makes being a scientist so cool. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Thaler. It's been really sure. fun. Sure. Let's do this you guys have a, a nice afternoon. Yes, I'm happy to come back sometime. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.